I mean, yeah, we haven't said anything damaging yet, so. Oh, good. Nothing incriminating? Not yet. Not yet. Excellent. Excellente. All right. Are we, are we good here? Um, oh, we have a few more people coming people in. People coming in. So All people. right. Yeah. So. Oh. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what was happening to me. Themselves. Kathy, you should join us or at least listen in after the program. The discussion is really interesting. Just be, I, a, be a little spy. Uh, I have my spy, the big spy. The big spy is there, Leslie. <laughs> That's right. That's you're, the spy. You're the big spy. Yes. We want you. I know, darling, but uh, it's just like, yes. anyway. You know, yeah. you know the drill, you know the story. Just so you all know, we hang out an hour about for about an hour after Feedback Friday is over, showing each other things that people are working on, having good conversations, weird conversations. Um, it's just, that is like so totally just, Amy. Feel good about life. Yeah, <laughs> me, I'm running the postage meter. Yeah, you want <laughs> we, we love what you do. I just, you're just so wonderful. It's, it's hard. We miss you. I miss you. I don't know about it. Where are you, Leslie? Where are you located? I'm in Eugene, and I am starting oh. a trip to um, your see. neighbor. Okay. Yeah. So here's the thing: the third week of August, we're having a thing, an in-person thing. Yes. Here. Yeah. So well, I, if it's put online, I will sign up for it because yeah. I am. We don't so even know what it is yet. We just have a space. <laughs> you sort of, I, don't, I don't care. Just, I'll just be there. Yeah, I don't, we're talking Amy, about if we, if we start wine walking drinking. now. If we Lots start of wine now, drinking we'll that day. <laughs> yes, you have yeah. to bring wine in your bags, but but yeah, and I will be with Kathy in Seattle. Hey. Okay. So yeah, be, so we're gonna we're trying to figure that out in the next, you know, soon so that people <laughs> If people want to come out, they can come out and hang. I'll be oh, there. Be... Oh, good okay, to you. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Good. All right. Let's mute all. There's a lot of people I can see that have mics that aren't muted. Oh, it's like it's Miss Amy. Can, she can see you. It's romper I'll room. <laughs> all, right, all right. Keith, are you ready? Uh, yeah. All right. Here we go. Hold I'm on. ready for that theme song. Yeah. Getty ready to dance, everyone. Oh, no. <laughs> Just a moment, please. One moment. One moment. Minor technical um, difficulties. Sorry, we are going to have a technical difficulty. Just a moment. I'm not quite sure why that just happened, but... <laughs> um, Kathy, I'm winging it, but something's going on over here for the first time. Here we go. Is it working? Pretend nobody else is here. <laughs> Just say the cuss word and then it'll Stop work. Has confidence, critical thinking, mm -hmm. and math rate with in person or online instruction. What, what is that? It's like, a, it's like you're on a podcast, Amy. What, what is happening? Hold on. This is really weird, you guys. I'm sorry. It must be the fillings in your teeth. Oh my God. <laughs> oh you're my picking God. up another broadcast somewhere. This is you had your funny. meditation podcast on instead of the Feedback Friday song. <laughs> this is so embarrassing. We yeah. want a live performance. Leslie, <laughs> I've had enough. Grace under pressure. You guys, I don't know what just happened to our Feedback Friday song. Maybe there's some voodoo that's happening here, but... No, don't you don't have it anymore. What's going on? That is you don't really have that little musical thing. Just a moment. I know where I can find it. Yeah. Just a moment. This isn't happening. It's it, this is not real. I, I thought you were gonna say to like uh, just a moment and then live Jimmy would show up with his guitar. That would be really good. But at this point, people who are joining us for the first time are like, these people are awful. <laughs> but we're really friendly okay we're really friendly well it's the end oh no hold on well now it's feedback friday so come on in come on
come sit down and stare at your screen. We've got to present what you never see. Dance, ladies. <laughs> We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, feedback, feedback Friday. And good morning. A little bit of a rocky start. It's a good thing that we are taking tranquilizers. Um, but welcome to Feedback Friday, episode 54. We don't really think it's as funny as we're acting, okay? <laughs> anyway. Feedback Friday is our weekly show where we speak with dyers, artists, scientists, writers, scholars, historians, growers, all sorts of folks who are interested in our favorite topic, which is natural dyes and color. And I'm Kathy Hottori, president of Botanical Colors, and we are really a professional organization, <laughs> despite what you have just seen. And joining me today is our director of sustainability and communications and the person who presses the music button, Amy Dufo. Great. So pleased to bring you episode 54. We've done this 54 times. It has been amazing. Uh, I think if we went back to our first version, my hair was maybe this long. <laughs> I was, was waiting. Longer. I'm waiting for to find my hairdresser so I can get a, a trim. Um, today, we are so pleased to have Keith Recker, who in, in addition to sharing some of the natural dye and pigment stories included in his book, True Colors, World Masters of Natural Dyes. Can you see it? No, nope. bring it down a little bit, Kathy. Bring it down. There, there we go. go. True Colors. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful book. And we, we just listed it online. If you don't have it yet, something to look at. Um, Keith will talk about something really interesting, how the human eye perceives color and how entered languages around the world. He's visiting us from Pittsburgh and has been involved in color, cultural craft revitalization and support. And my phone is ringing and designed for many years. We're so pleased to have him join us. Um, before we start, <laughs> it's one of those days. Says my internet connection's unstable and so am I. Um, before we start, I wanna send out a huge thank you to everyone who joins us for Feedback Friday. We couldn't do it without you. Yeah, you're frozen. I'm frozen. How's it going? <laughs> can you hear me? Kathy, you're, yeah, we can, we can hear you. Did you was I doing like the da, 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 da thing? Oh, Something yeah. like that, right? Okay. Um, anyway, thank you, everyone. It's been amazing to have you join us every week. And uh, we couldn't do it without your support. And it, it, Feedback Friday has kind of morphed into this amazing uh, event now. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, for a little housekeeping, Amy is our moderator. <clears throat> She'll be monitoring the chat. We have the chat uh, closed until after Keith's presentation, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, we also would like you to mute until he's completed his presentation, and then we'll open it up. Um, and don't forget to stay tuned for picture of the week. Week, week, week. Man, that's just like, <laughs> should have practiced more here. Um, after we announce who we saw as a standout this week, then we'll all say hello, goodbye, and um, get ready for the second part of Feedback Friday, which is the Amy show. Um, the call's being recorded. We will have a video copy ready uh, for you and any additional information resulting from this call. So without any further ado, and hopefully with no further uh, uh, little interruptions. Um, I'd just like to welcome Keith and see this wonderful presentation. Thanks, Keith, so much for joining us. Absolutely. It's such a pleasure uh, and an honor. And I have to say, I can see the participant panel. And um, of all the groups I've talked to, the largest was um, to a very dark pre-COVID auditorium at Parsons School of Design, where I couldn't see anybody's face. So this second largest group I've ever talked to, I can see everybody's faces across the grid, which is really lovely. So hello out there. I'm really happy to be with you. 
So I have a lot to talk about and probably too much to talk about. So I'm going to get on with it. Um, here we go, if I can share the screen. Here we are. So this is the cover that Kathy showed you of the second edition of True Colors. And I think it might be important to confess that the origin of this book actually comes from my other great love in the world behind, behind color, which is food. Um, a friend of mine gifted me a session with an Ayurvedic astrologist who told me that as a Taurus, whose sky was dominated by the planet Jupiter, that I would never be thin. And out of the devastation of hearing that probable truth, <laughs> I thought, well, if this is true, I had better get busy and understand food a little bit better and my relationship to it. And of course, you know, I started reading um, that wonderful guy, Michael Pollan, and a few other people's books. And I realized that all of these writings had made a pretty fundamental change in policy around food, let alone our own feelings about it, right? We have identified and we worship people who grow great food, same with people who cook great food that's grown well and, and cooked well, served well. Um, we have new phrases like food desert, which I think come out of this new realization about where we are with food and, and who doesn't have access to that. And I thought to myself, wow, there's nothing or very little going on in the public sphere about this in, in fiber and color. You better go away. Right, my great love. So I thought, okay, I, I, I better get busy. I better start trying to put an oar in the water and contribute uh, to get that conversation started. So that's how True Colors was born. And let me see if I can advance my screen. There we go. Okay. So let's talk about how we perceive color. Um, the image on the left is the way that our ancestors about 30.6 million years ago probably saw things because they only had, they were only uh, bichromats. They only had two sets of color perceiving rods in their retinas, blue and green. 30.6 million years ago, when our ancestors started to come down out of the trees and walk on two legs and um, encounter life on the savanna, somehow the adaptation of a third set of rods of cones made its way into our retina. So that was the red set. So we have three, red, blue, and green. And this red set, of course, enables us to see things like yellow and orange, which is amazing. So we moved from being able to perceive probably about a million variations of color to 10 million variations of color in trichromat vision. Now, how does that happen? That happens because each of those three sets of um, cones has a different light reactive protein called a chromophore. And when that light reactive protein encounters the waves of length the, the, the wavelengths of light that, that activate it, it generates a specific enzyme, opsin 1, opsin 2, and opsin 3. And the mixture of those enzymes headed directly to our optic nerve, which goes right into our frontal cortex, is the mechanics of our way of perceiving color. It's fast, it's light activated. So many things can affect the quality of the wavelengths and the combination of wavelengths that come our way. Um, it's the most immediate of the senses, right? It's coming from light waves, which are super fast through the super fast mechanism into the brain. It's the least mediated and the fastest of the senses. I find all this so fascinating because like every machine, like every old fashioned watch, like every car, the way the machine acts and reacts over time is bound to depart slightly from the norm, right? Your car can veer a little bit to the left. Your passenger window can be stubborn and going up or down. I think that our physical mechanism allows for these sorts of personal individual variations, which means that my visual experience is not very likely to be identical to the visual experience of the person next to me. And that sends me into a whole range of wonderings about, is this why it's so hard to communicate in words about color? Is this why it's so hard to communicate in words about all sensory experiences? That we're all having slightly different versions 
of reality come to our brains uh, for processing. I think it's fascinating. It helps explain so much, right? About reaching out to each other and overcoming those gaps and bridges between our experience and the person next to us. Now, trichromats, right? If we're seeing 10 million variations of color with relative clarity with the three sets of, of rods and cones, that's not the end of the conversation. I'm sure some of you have heard of the term tetrachromat. There is recent evidence of uh, a fourth set of cones being present in the retinas of about 25% of women and 8% of men. And scientists hypothesize, they're not quite sure yet, that this additional processing capacity is on the yellow wavelengths. So this would mean that tetrachromats can see 100 million variations of color. And there are a couple of filmed interviews with tetrachromat artists trying to describe the nature of their visual experience. And part of the fascination for me is people trying to tell you what it's like not to see white because white breaks down into subtle shades of color, not really seeing black because black becomes dynamic with color, not being able to see any real pure dark value because the gradations in between each of those values are alive. So imagine if the standard visual capacity was multiplied by 10, what we might be seeing. And who knows whether this evolution will become widespread in the human population like the addition of red did, right? And we might wonder why red became widespread throughout the human population. Um, there's a lot of thinking that it had to do with being better able to perceive ripening fruit, right? That the red and, val red and yellow values of ripening fruit will be more apparent to us in contrast with the green. But there are some scientists who think that that's a bunch of hooey because there are plenty of other mechanisms to perceive ripening fruit, right? Scale, weight, smell, seasonality, that, that we need not have been dependent on visual. There's a crackpot theory that I'm gonna mention because I love it so much, totally unsubstantiated, but again, I love it so much, that red became widespread through the human population because it's a social adaptation, that it gives us insight into our expressions of passion, of rage, of delight, of health or not health. And I find that fascinating. Imagine trying to perceive each other without the benefit of red without the benefit of being able to read the cheeks, being able to read the lips, being able to read the eyes fully. I think it does have something to do with why it became essential to our existence as a social species. Now, lest we feel so proud of our ability to see 10 to 100 million variations of color, I would like to introduce you to the uh, mantis shrimp, one of the most colorful animals. Uh, if anybody's watching the color program uh, that Richard Attenborough just did for Netflix, uh, this little fellow was featured on there. He has, or she, has the most amazing optical mechanism. There are 12 different sets of color and light receptors in those independently moving double eyeballs there. And of course, they see red, blue, green. They also see other colors, and they see things that we can't. So among those perceptors are uh, the ability to perceive linear and nonlinear polarized light. This means that when one of these guys is hiding in a little hidey hole, their brethren and sistren can see that there's someone hiding in there because of the polarized reflected light coming off of the shell. And that means they don't crowd the same hiding hole in the presence of a predator, they find a different one. So it's a social adaptation that helps them evade predators. And I link that back to my suspicion that red may have been a social adaptation for us. Now let's talk about language, right? Language is one of the ways that we try to build these bridges between our experience and someone else's. And the work of professors Berlin and Kay at Stanford in 1968, which they repeated with a bigger sample size in, in 2008, reveals that color terms enter human, language, human languages around the world in a very predictable pattern. The words for dark and light are always the first two words in every language that has two words for color. Some only have one. Guess what the third is? Of course, it's red. In every human language that has three terms for color, red is always the third one. And how logical when you look at human behavior that we would be first concerned with the color of our life before the usual fourth color comes in, green. 
We're preoccupied, of course, with ourselves and what makes our heart beat before we can look out and perceive life on the outside. Um, sometimes yellow is the fourth term, but it's usually green, right? They take turns a little bit, but it's usually green. And then there's blue. If we had more time, I have a very long anecdote about the Victorians and their suspicions about uh, earlier civilization, civilizations not being able to see blue, which of course is not true. And then after blue comes all the other terms in a somewhat unpredictable sequence. There's brown, pink, purple, uh, gray, all of those sort of singular words that we know denote a specific range of color. They come after uh, blue. It's interesting to note that human language may still be in uh, an evolutionary position in color terms. If we look specifically at orange, which only entered the English language in about the late 1500s, uh, we could also note that the symbolism around orange is a little bit thin and scarce because of this very recent entry into the language. We may be acquiring new color terms soon when there's something important for us to capture. Orange only entered because of the fruit orange entering global commerce and it being such a perfect expression of that color between yellow and red uh, that we worked that word in across Europe, actually, not just English. All right, so the rainbow. Let's just one quick note about the rainbow. <clears throat> Did you know that before 1660 and Isaac Newton, the rainbow was thought to only have five colors? And that Newton, in a search for symmetry and resonance across multiple phenomenon, thought it would be better to have seven. So he went for an echo of the seven days of the week and the seven chromatic notes of the Western musical scale. And it was he who added indigo and orange to the rainbow, right? Which was previously only five tones. Okay, so one more note before we get into some of the, the, the stories in True Colors. This diagram really fascinates me. The left-hand side tracks the genetic roots of peoples around the world. So you see that first branching is the departure from Africa. The second branching is the branching off between mostly Asia and mostly Europe. And the part on the right is um, done by a linguist named Merit Rulin, who studied languages around the world. And you'll note that the genetic tree and the language slash culture tree are so closely intertwined, right? They mirror each other almost perfectly. And the reason I find that so fascinating is that when we start to think about how ancient textile traditions really are, we go pretty far back in terms of shared heritage. So I was telling Kathy and Amy the other day that the oldest evidence we have of dyed fiber to my knowledge is at about 34,000 years ago in a cave known to have been a site of human habitation in the Republic of Georgia. And scientists were looking at pollen samples to see if they could learn something about the environment, about perhaps eating habits. And what they found quite by accident was very clear evidence of twisted flax fibers, which have been dyed, of course, with natural substances. So there was a blue, there was a green, there was a pink, there was a gray, there was a yellow. We don't know what those dyes were, of course. But think about that, 34,000 years ago is pretty close to the second branching point, which was probably 60,000 years ago. And really that's not that all that distant from the first branching point, which was 80 to 100,000 years ago. Did you all read about the recent um, unearthing of a child's burial in Africa dating back to about 78,000 years? There's a very clear indication that this child you know, died prematurely. Um, was rested on a pillow of perishable material. And there's even a mention in the write-ups of it that there might have been a shroud. But 78,000 years ago, sitting of course in soil, uh, we don't have those perishable fibers to analyze or to speak about. There's only the notion that there probably was that matter given how the bones were settling uh, and some small evidence of organic material. So think about that. We may have been making textiles and dyeing them from the very first shared moments of our speciesood, right? I find that fascinating. It's part of language, it's part of visual perception, it's part of our being. So 
let's go to a different way of looking at the beginning point of our fascination with color. This is a photograph of a red ochre mine in the Straits of Hormuz in the Republic of Iran. And it happens to be located uh, just where um, biblical historians feel the Garden of Eden might have been located. And I find this red ochre color so evocative because Adam means red earth. And if you look at, at Genesis, there's the notion that the first man was formed of the dust of the ground and the breath of the divine. So here is this red color right at the very beginning of the first person. And here is someone that I think a lot of you will know named Heidi Gustafson, who's an artist who makes it her business uh, to collect pigment, earth pigments from all over the world. She documents place. She documents the variation, the natural variation of, uh, of geology. And she brings these colors back to make the most gorgeous chromatic work. And one of the things that she says about her work is that she feels that it's her obligation to reunite all the red ochres from around the world so that they can stand counsel in her studio and speak with one voice again. And I find that so beautiful at this particular moment in time, right? When we all need to, to do the same. Another red, another ancient red, right? We have evidence of matter, uh, dying with matter that goes back at least 4,000 years old. This is a, a woven quiver cover found in the grave goods of an Egyptian official. It was dyed with matter. And I find this a little bit interesting because um, this was dating back to, I think, 2,800 years. This quiver cover made its way from Mesopotamia all the way across the ancient world to Egypt uh, as a prestige item. And I think that speaks to the ancient nature of the value that we place on craftsmanship and color. It's another reminder of what we share. So the fellow on the left here is Fatul Kenjayev. He's a, a natural dyer. He's quite a master. He's been an instructor with a UNESCO sponsored school in Bukhara, Uzbekistan for many years. He was not always a natural dyer. He was actually a furrier until the collapse of the Soviet Union forced him to find some new ways of expressing his uh, skills and making a living. Um, in his studio, they make all kinds of warm colors using matter as the base. And I find it fascinating. Matter has about 12 natural colorants contained within its roots. Alizarin, purpurin, pseudopurpurin, mengistun, and depending on the processing of the root, and of course, additives and modifiers in the dye vat, this whole library of colors from vivid scarlet all the way to a strange kind of muddy ochre can be made using matter. Gorgeous material. And here is my, my dear friend, Antonio. Um, he is the brother-in-law to Porfirio Gutierrez and the husband to Juana Gutierrez. Um, they're a Zapotec family specializing in natural dyeing and weaving. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of Porfirio, who is such an eloquent and descriptive uh, character uh, in terms of um, helping us understand more about Zapotec culture. They hosted me for about a week in their studio in Teotitlan, and I got to observe firsthand the harvesting of the cochineal beetle, which grows on the paddles of the Opuntia cactus. Um, it was and this bug was was domesticated by the ancestors of the current day Zapotecs about 2000 years ago. Domesticated versions of the beetle have about 25% body weight of carminic acid, which was what makes the beautiful red color you see in the ground powder of dried beetles on the upper right of the screen. Um, absolutely fascinating. Across these few days together, Juana, you see Juana in the in all of these pictures here, showed me that she is able to make uh, 25 or 26 different shades uh, using cochineal. Sometimes varying mordants, sometimes varying modifiers, sometimes through a sequence of over dyeing, she can make about 26 different shades of scarlet, burgundy, pink, coral, orange. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And in observing these things, I came to understand that there's actually a lot of work to do uh, in terms of documenting Zapotec dyeing traditions. There are leaves that they use for mordants, which are unidentified. I even went to the one of the founders of the textile museum and showed him this leaf called lengua de vaca. He had no idea what it was. He's like, yeah, I know it's out there. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> is it an aluminum accumulator? I have no idea. Um, but it, it, uh, Juana uses it to create this beautiful dry coral color in the studio, which is so fantastic. Um, Porfirio in the bottom here is collecting um, tagetes lucida, 
Mexican mint marigold. And I find that one super fascinating. Of course, it makes a, a beautiful yellow color, particularly Juana is very good with that one. She makes mustards, Naples yellows, uh, ochre yellows. I find it very interesting because Tagetes lucida is one of the flowers that the Aztecs used in this dust that they concocted to blow into the faces of um, people who are about to be sacrificed in ritual um, to kind of numb their senses a little bit. And it is also said to be used by the Huichol, uh, the, the Wicari Indians um, natives to do the same sort of hallucinogenic work. I don't think this would be quite enough for me if I were about to be sacrificed uh, in a ritual, but um, I respect the tradition. And these are the carpets uh, that Porfirio has designed and, and woven. And I find the bottom one, the sort of checkerboard one, most fascinating. Um, this is a rug version of a petate. And the petate are these woven palm mats, which are omnipresent in Zapotec life. You're probably born in one. Prior to the advent of the coffin, you were probably wrapped in one when you died. You probably stood on one in front of the altar to be married. Your children were probably all baptized standing on one. You were standing on one when you were baptized. And he thought that this was such an important ritual and yet humble, unattended thing that he wanted to find a way to encode it in rug form. And it's really, it's among my most favorite of his designs. I think it's interesting to note that natural color has a role in preserving visual languages of culture, but it also is an evolving thing too. And I think we are starting to see it as a possible solution to environmental problems. So the slide here is of uh, a group called Avani working in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, I think some of you know Rashmi Bharti. This is a plant called um, Ageratina adenophora. It is an invasive species that was brought around the world uh, as an ornamental garden plant. Its origins are in central Mexico. And in many places, it is a killer. Its name in uh, one of the native languages in the Himalayas is Banmara, which means forest killer. So Avani saw this thing kind of going out of control and they tested it and it yields a very beautiful yellow color. So they're now starting to eradicate it in large parts of the forest floor so that the ecosystem can grow back and they're paying people to do it and they're creating beautiful color. So you see the uh, green here at the bottom that is Ageratina adenophora with some iron. And here's the more of the yellow version. There's an olive version. My favorite of course is the ball of yarn uh, at the bottom left which is dipped quickly in an indigo exhaust vat. Um, I love that chartreuse color, it's one of my favorite colors. Um, yeah, absolutely gorgeous work. And here is an example of sort of the rarely achieved natural green capacity of plants. Um, on the lower right really is the, the most interesting one. Um, this is Bacharis genesteloides, referred to as Kinsakuchu in uh, Quechua. And this plant grows on the Eastern face of the Andes mountains where the humidity of the Amazon basin flows up and uh, keeps the uh, biosphere quite damp. And there's only when there's a fungus growing on this plant, does it produce the beautiful teals in the skeins at the upper right, right? Otherwise it's just sort of a weak yellow sort of tannin based thing. Um, so Kathy had mentioned that there's probably a cyan, you had the right word, cyan, cyan something that's part of the fungus, right? That creates the, right. the blue green color. Which is yeah, it's a part of, it's a cyanin beautiful. And the plant on the left is Bacharis latifolia. You see the similarities in the flower, if not in the plant. And uh, that creates a more olive color range, which you can see at the upper right. That's a bit blue in the photo. It's gone all quite gray, but it's very olivey. And this is Nilda Kalanyapa, uh, who leads the Center for Traditional Textile, Textiles of Cusco. Uh, and she's given credit by her weavers as being the person that has helped um, textile traditions from the Cusco region survive to this day. And she does such great work. So she wanted to, she chose these photographs and she wanted to show them because she wanted us to see why the colors from these two natural green making plants play a role in their color library. That for them, it's important to depict the variety of nature in as many pieces as possible. They're not monochromatic in their color orientation. They wanna see it all. They want the full rainbow presentation in a good piece of textiles. 
Here's one of my favorites. I'm sure you, some of you are aware of um, Adiv Pure Nature, which is the creation of Rupa Trivedi in Mumbai. Um, through, I tell the full story in the book, I won't repeat it here. Um, Rupa had this realization that natural dying in India was all but dead. And she wanted to find a way to revive it. And her path to that has a lot to do with spirituality. So it's no surprise that she ends up being the first person ever to collect temple offerings after they've been wilted to turn them into a really beautiful language of contact dyes and dye vat material. And of course the primary dye stuff is marigolds, which are offered by the millions and billions across India every day. Tradition demands that these temple offerings be scattered on the water. They cannot be treated like garbage. They're supposed to be scattered on the water so that the blessings of the offering can dissipate back into the universe. And Rupa convinced the priests at the biggest temple in Mumbai that what she was doing with contact dyeing and dye vats did that work, right? That the blessings would dissipate back into the universe through the steam and through the dye pot. So I love what she's doing. And she has a very loyal client clientele in Eileen Fisher, uh, in Dosa, and uh, Kim Seibert doing table linens and a few other companies. This is Rupa and her chief dyer, Mukhtar. Every aspect of the business is sustainable and every aspect of her employment of people in a disadvantaged neighborhood in Mumbai is socially responsible. It's a real visionary proposition. And I feel like what she does opens up such an example to textile based companies of what's possible with this work. This of course is Indigo, right? Um, I want to talk a little bit about Indigo in West Africa. These are the dwellings of the Telem people. That is the Bandiagara escarpment, which is famous uh, because if you can see in the little top layer of the dwellings, the two top layers of the dwellings, those are sealed off, they have no windows. Those are actually tombs. The Telem people 1100 years ago, 1200 years ago, sealed their dead in these tombs with a library of textiles. These were the grave goods. And the textiles uh, discovered by Dutch archeologists in the 70s express an amazing range of natural color and pattern, some woven, some tie dyed. And of course, the most prominent color is indigo. So indigo's history in this part of the world goes back over a thousand years. Um, I took uh, the work of Heartware, which is a nonprofit based in Paris that has worked with Beninese indigo dyers for 20 some years now, been writing about them for a while. So it takes me a minute to tabulate. And they take Yoruba indigo, uh, they dry it. Mostly they source it from their um, Yoruba ancestors across the border in Nigeria. Uh, and they bring it to Benin and they do the full indigo process. Um, they take some ideas from French designers and other designers around the world. So sometimes they get quite simple. Um, I visited the village where they tie these knots and it is the most amazing and humbling experience to see the precision of the pinching and the twisting so that all the knots are the same size. It's just gorgeous being there with them. This is Silikath, uh, the head dyer uh, in uh, Cotonou, the capital of Benin. She knows what she's doing and she knows how to run a workshop. She doesn't particularly like to be interviewed, <laughs> but she's really super knowledgeable. And this is some of the work that I got to see drawing on the line, really just breathtaking. Um, this is uh, from Bolivia. Uh, this is bromeliad hieronymi, a ground dwelling bromeliad grows in the wild. And it is used by the Aorio people who are one generation in maybe, a gen maybe two generations at this point from their pre-contact life in the Gran Chaco forest, which stretches from parts of Bolivia through Paraguay to parts of Argentina. It's a very disadvantaged group these days uh, because as they came out of the forests, uh, they found themselves landless and without rights. And so they have very few ways from their culture of earning uh, a living. And one of them is the making of these gorgeous bags. I'm gonna show the bags first. These are called Utebetai. And the Utebetai uh, were these different patterns. There were seven patterns. They delineated clan membership which I suppose in times of peace was good and in times of war was maybe not so good. Uh, these days, anybody can wear any pattern. Um, they are hand knotted. It takes 437 meters of thigh spun bromeliad fiber to make one modestly sized bag. 
the only reason these bags still exist is that it is still a mark of serious uh, respect and esteem for a man to carry a bag who's been made for him by his wife. The women themselves make bags out of wool and acrylic and market available fiber. So as soon as the men no longer place esteem on this, uh, the craft form is likely to fall into disuse. So we may be about 10 years away from losing that amazing art form. So they use, uh, they use different kinds of bark for the most part, uh, one kind of berry to make kind of a blue black. It's a very simple and amazing craft. And here is um, Abatuk Avendaño. He's one of 19 men who have a license from the Mexican government to harvest the uh, shellfish purple of the southwest coast of Oaxaca. This is a Mixtec tradition that goes back at least 1500 years. The Mixtec have been managing this resource with real serious ecological responsibility for all of that time. There's so much mysticism around this color, which in part comes from the fact that the female mollusks are bigger and yield more dye than the male mollusks. And through Mishtek observation, they came to discover that these shells, these shellfish took about a month to recharge their supply of dye. So the link between those things uh, develops a real female mysticism around this beautiful red violet color. You can see that Abakuk is plucking the shell from the rock stimulating the foot of the mollusk and applying the secretion directly onto skeins of cotton yarn that he carries around his wrist. If you look closely at the bottom left photograph, you can see that the substance goes from a kind of gross snotty yellow green to blue. And then as it oxidizes in the presence of sunlight, a very color fast, very vivid red violet. So cool. Now this, like so many traditions, is in danger. The, the shellfish population has plummeted in the last few years, at first because a Japanese company came in and was actually killing the shellfish on their way to creating the, the beautiful red-violet color. That was stopped. And now the, pot, the, the shellfish population is in danger because local fishermen are catching them with regular shellfish to cut up into ceviche and serve to tourists. So we are within probably five years of no longer having this dye available to us. Abba Cook tells that when he was a boy, uh, they would take this kind of then quite epic journey across rivers and having to work for a few days in a field to earn enough money for food to complete the journey. They would spend months at the seashore, uh, mostly during the summertime, and then come back with about 40 sacks of triple, quadruple dyed uh, purple yarn, some of it quite, quite dark and glossy. And now they're able to single dye, which ends up with this lilac color you see here, uh, only about 16 skeins of yarn. So we're really at a, at a dangerous moment with this. Um, the cloth that you see in the background is a posa juanco. It's a traditional women's wrap skirt. There are still women who know what the symbols woven into these strips mean, not too many. Um, these are the three sacred colors of Oaxaca, cochineal, which we talked about with Juana and Porfirio. Indigo, which uh, grows in the Isthmus region, the southernmost region of Oaxaca. Uh, Indigofera sufruticosa is the species that grows there. And of course, the shellfish purple. It's amazing. It's just absolutely an amazing tradition. And you see the real beauty, right, of that color. It's just stunning. Interestingly, chemically, this red-violet dye is quite similar to indigo. Uh, as a matter of fact, the dye producing molecule here is called a brominated indigoid, which I think is something I want to mutter under my breath after a bad meeting, right? Um, but it's, it's chemically quite different. Bromine is very common in seawater. And so that's an interesting union between the land produced indigo molecule and the marine produced shellfish purple. Okay, this is our last bit. Um, this is Sasha Dewar. I'm sure a lot of you are very aware of Sasha. Uh, she teaches at the California College of the Arts. She spent a day with us in her beautiful garden in Berkeley. It was during June, hence the poppies. And um, she wanted to show us what she can make across a day just using a pair of clippers in her garden and some boiling water. And it was an amazing exercise. Um, this is rosemary being turned into this beautiful soft uh, gray green color. This is Dyer's chamomile of course, which was just beautiful. Um, this was raw indigo, which she put in a blender. 
uh, and produced this gorgeous turquoise, kind of daiquiri green. Uh, she did some dyers weld with us. Uh, the spruce tips are from a different dyeing session. Um, the vivid yellow and orange on the lower left come from citrus peel. She seems to be able to coax color out of so many things. And all of this is done um, because she feels that it's her job to provide a gateway drug for her students to achieve what she calls a state of eco-awareness. And eco-awareness is a term invented by Stephen Rockefeller, who was Sasha's dean and instructor at Middlebury College in Vermont. He was also instrumental in drafting the Earth Charter, which was adopted by the United Nations in the 70s. And the Earth Charter says a lot of things that we would recognize about environmental responsibility and you know, taking care of the Earth. But the reason I'm bringing it up today in the, in the context of eco-awareness is that it also has some super eloquent language from Rockefeller himself about our obligation to educate future generations about what the environment brings us and why it's important. And it was Rockefeller's conviction that humans are capable of ignoring data until the cows come home. That just because we have information does not mean we do the right thing, doesn't mean we think the right thing, doesn't mean we believe the right thing. His thought was we have to have these juicy, meaningful sensory experiences so that we're in a relationship with our environment. And only then when we have that emotional attachment can we think and commit and not swerve from what we should be doing and thinking. And I think all of us who love fiber and color and natural textiles, we're on that path. And I think we have to find ways to, to help young people particularly get on that path, right? Because we have something amazing in terms of this relationship to the environment and what is beautiful and what is useful and why it's so vital that we maintain it. So that was why I wrote the book, right? Once I moved on from my obsession with food, this sense of responsibility and possibility and natural color was, was why I wrote the book. So thank you for listening. I'm here for questions. I love questions. So. Keith, thank you. <clears throat> that was just amazing. So good. Okay. Um, you can go ahead and stop your share and okay. then we're gonna turn it over to Amy. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Those are oak dolls, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Our, someone, someone emailed, or I guess it was on Instagram, they said, what are those little beads that you have? And it was like, oh yeah, they do look like beads, don't they? <laughs> they sort of do. That was really, really fascinating. Thank I just you. love that cultural and genetic development chart that you showed. You know, you were on it for a while, so I could like kind of read it. It was pretty incredible how, pretty. We, how we just evolved that way. Yeah. Um, okay, Amy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey. Let's see, let's just jump on in. I hope we have no mistakes. Thanks. <laughs> I hope so. so Helen's asking, what are the additions to the second edition of the book? Yeah, um, the work of the Beninese group is the big um, addition. And um, I, if I can confess, I was made aware of one error, one actual factual error that I had where it made, that made its way into the book. If you want, I'll tell you what it is. Um, I was feverishly trying to complete one of the chapters and I was doing some research in an old library in New Mexico. And I went to a dictionary to trace the etymology of the word woad. And I swear to God in that dictionary, I swear to God, it linked it to the word weed. And, and woad of course grows like a weed in what, 32 of the lower 48 states. And so I make this link in the text. Of course, you know, alas, the word woad has nothing to do with the word weed. And Jenny Balfour Paul sent me the very gentlest, loveliest email saying, you know, Keith, could you trace for me the reference behind your linkage etymologically? I'm like, oh, Jenny, I can't. I'm really sorry. <laughs> One of those things where, like, I remember there was a girl in high school and she didn't get in the high school yearbook her picture and everybody got stickers to put in, in the book after to put poor mm -hmm. Susie Mott's picture in. But maybe you could do that. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. But the second edition takes care of that. And uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Is there a reason why the Mexican purple mollusks can't be farmed? That's a great question. I have never heard anyone um, begin to discuss that, but that could be a potential solution that emerges. Right now, the group of dyers is trying to conduct a community education program uh, amongst the local fishermen to, you know, try to get them to, to you know, lay off the poor purpura panza uh, species 
Um, that's a bit of a slow burn, right? As we all know. And, um, but that's a great, that's a great question. I've not heard anyone talk about it. I spent some time talking with the great and amazing Marta Turok, who was instrumental in getting this listed as an endangered craft and as something of national importance. And I've not heard her mention farming either. It's a good question. This is a great question too. Do you think we will evolve to see more new colors that we don't see now? It seems inevitable. It seems inevitable. The way in which we are perceiving reality has so much to do with technology now um, that you would think that we would begin to sort of grow in a slightly different way. And also the way in which our environment is endangered and the ways in which that may have an effect on our health you might think that we would we would begin to be able to perceive, whether that's evolution or social habit, I don't know, we would be able to begin to perceive the signals of health and not health in the environment in a different way as well. Mm -hmm. So that may be you know, an adaptation of vocabulary and a habit of seeing as opposed to evolution, but perhaps it's also evolution. Fascinating. Let's see, um, I wondered selfishly if you know of any diet traditions in Scotland. <gasps> such a good question yes yes i do and um not many right but there are certainly natural dye stuffs that have to do with the coastal environment of scotland um that are fascinating i'm not an expert in it by any means but i love stories about seaweed there are also some stories ancient stories that there are various uh shellfish species which were used to make fake or augment fake imperial purple in the ancient and medieval world so, and I see a question here about uh, whether the Mexican mollusks are related to the unknown purple mollusk in Israel, right, uh, that went into Tekelet. And I think that all of the Mediterranean species that I'm aware of that went into imperial purple in the Roman world needed to be killed, unfortunately, in order to release this chemical in the hypobrachial gland. Whereas in the Mexican shellfish, it's much closer to the mouth of the mollusk and they make more of it. So you can just stimulate it, which I'm just talking around the fact that they're probably frightening it, right? Because they're releasing this chemical, which in their case is a neurotoxin they use to subdue their prey, which is smaller shellfish. Um, but in the Mediterranean traditions, the shellfish had to be killed. There wasn't that much of the necessary chemical in each mollusk, so they had to kill thousands upon thousands upon thousands to get a few grams of dye. And there was also some kind of fermentation process. It's not all perfectly, uh, of course, perfectly documented, but it sounds a lot like the multiple step process of indigo, right? Taking things, getting access to the chemical outside the confines of the cell, creating an environment where it probably can be broken apart so that it can be water soluble, taken up by the fiber and then removed and reoxidized. It's this multiple step process that probably resembles indigo. Okay, so let's see. Um, which came first, do you suppose, the color name car carmine or the chemical name carminic acid? Uh, I think carminic acid came from the word carmine because it produced it, right? So the chemical awareness comes later, more or less scientific age. Um, and I think carmine comes from the word kermes, right? Which was one of the European scale insects that was used to make red in the ancient world. So I think the, yeah, the word kermes, carmine, and then carminic acid. Good question. Cool question, I hope you can answer it. Uh, I have heard several people, women who are painters, say that after they had a cataract operation that they saw completely different colors or saw colors very differently after their operation. Do you have any theories as to why that might be? Well, sure. You know, I'm going to give an example of, of why the sky is blue and the sun is yellow, right? When the, when the full spectrum wavelengths of sunlight reach the Earth's atmosphere, the gas molecules of our atmosphere scatter the bluest values of the spectrum to some degree, which is why we see this blue vault over us. And as a result of that scattering, uh, the sun looks a little more yellow, right? Because some of the cooler end of the spectrum has been removed from the light that's coming down to, to greet us. So same thing when you have cataracts or some occlusion in your lens or in your retina, you're probably encountering not the full spectrum of light. There's interference enough that you're 
perceptions, what's coming to your retina are, you know, not full spectrum. Okay, that's great. Um, lots of questions about about things that are happening to eyes and how people see differently. But we're going to take one more question because we're at 1258, if you can believe it. Right. So Angela is asking, besides your love of food and color, how did you come to do this kind of research and writing? Um, I have confessed, you know, to other to other groups um, who've asked this question. I've never had a course in our history. Uh, I've never had a course in art making. Um, that my whole devotion to color comes from my education in literature and creative writing, right? So my study was in American lit, English lit, writing poetry. Um, and this notion of communicating, this notion of capturing sensory experience, this notion of capturing ideas and imagination, we're so dependent on color to convey those symbol systems, to really reach our interlocutors, if you will, um, with any degree of penetration, just like Stephen Rockefeller, any degree of relationship as opposed to just fact. We're so dependent on color. And it, I've always been attracted to color. Uh, when I was young, particularly, I had um, pretty vivid synesthesia. Um, it's a little bit duller now. And so I knew I was having an experience that other people weren't having. And trying to find a way to express all of that in words really cultivated my interest in color. Later on, when I entered the retail marketplace, um, Saks Fifth Avenue, Gump's in San Francisco, Bloomingdale's, um, I realized that part of my job was to communicate via color to the consumer and to tell a story that the consumer would be interested in that would fill a thirst or a need uh, on their part. And you know that really began my relationship with Pantone and WGSN and Color Association of the USA in terms of trend and color forecasting. So, it's a long answer to say that it all comes from this desire, this need to connect and communicate. And we as humans have a few ways to do that. And you know, words is one, color is another. Thanks. Fabulous. Thank you again, Keith. Thank you. It was you so are so welcome to stay and hang out with us. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to do the some reminders for people and then talk about who we are. Um, hosting next week and then Amy does picture of the week. Well, I am going to stick around. I'm going to I'm going to hide myself, but I am going to stick around. So thank you all for listening. It was such an honor to be with you and and maybe we'll do really it again. Great. I really great. appreciate it. All right. So let me just go through a few um, announcements. Um, the uh, Mother's Day is coming, guys. <laughs> Mother's Day is coming. <laughs> um, so if you forgot to get mom something and she's a natural dyer, we have gift cards on the site. Um, have a look at those. Uh, we also uh, just dropped some um, beautiful hand spun, hand woven fabrics. Some of them indigo dyed from 1111, which is the a clothing brand based out of India. They're really lovely. So if you have any interest, um, those are on the site. We still have our kits on site uh, on sale. So treat yourself to one of those. We've got Cara Marie Piazza's uh, Botanical Dyeing Kit, Kristen Art Scrambles Quilts Instant Indigo Shibori Kit, and then our very own Dyes of the Americas, which includes the uh, Tagetis Lucida that Keith spoke about, which um, is called Pericon. And um, also just, I have a huge ask for everybody, and that is two things. I have two asks, actually. The first is um, a thank you that those of you who have been donating to our scholarship fund to let you know that we were actually able to fund um, five scholarships this season. And so five people were able to attend classes and workshops that they normally would not have been able to. Um, we would like to extend a few more uh, this summer. And so if you are of the inclination, we would welcome those donations. Even small donations really added up and helped us just defray the cost of um, being able to help people join in workshops that they otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, participate in. So thank you for that. And just want to kind of give that a little bump if you're um, interested. The second one is more serious. And that is, um, as you know, our, our business is intimately entwined with um, that of products that come from India. 
We get many of our um, best dyes from them. I have very long relationships with people that I've been working with since um, the early 2000s. And I have either studied with them or they are colleagues who are doing natural dye research. And as many of you, probably all of you know, um, they are experiencing a horrific and tragic COVID surge. And so Amy has in the chat um, a few organizations that um, I've donated to. I, we, we're not holding our own fundraiser, but there's a spice company out of Oakland, California called Diaspora that I spoke about last week. They're running a, a fundraiser for oxygen, tanks, concentrators, PPE, um, also food, you know, if you're locked down, it's hard to go get food. You know, in India, there's a lot of going to the market every day, getting the foods you need, cooking those foods. And they're not able to do that right now because they're all, everyone's locked down in the large cities in order to try to stop the spread. So have a look at that in the chat. If you are able, um, please help out those, those incredible artists uh, and businesses that are helping us create natural dye, um, natural dye experiences here in the United States. We have very few dyes that are native to the United States that we can buy in volume. So we get a lot of things from uh, Central Asia, um, Central America, the Americas, and of course, India. Um, so if you can help at all, I'd so appreciate it. And that's it on the reminders. Next week, we have Natalie Channon coming from Alabama Channon. Um, this is such a treat. Natalie is a legend in um, the sustainable fashion industry. She left New York and went to Alabama, which is her birthplace, to create a, a vernacular fashion coming out of Alabama and using the incredible stitching skills from her own um, hometown. And so she's gonna be joining us to talk about um, an overview of 20 years of finding a sense of place and the Alabama Channon seed to shelf cottage industry business model, as well as her design process and experience working with natural dyes and a domestic supply chain. Um, we'll also be able to show you a natural dye collection that we've been part of and um, that they are launching next week. So join us then. I'm gonna turn it over to Amy for picture of the week. Oh my gosh, week, week, week. I'm trying to add all these links and people are asking questions. So uh oh. Kathy, if you can, yes. while I'm doing picture of the week, week, week. Yes, answer uh, chat. People don't have Instagram. So I li had linked to some Instagram pages for the Spice Company and also- Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me find a website for you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. I will do that. Okay, just a moment now. Where did, oh, here it is. Here it is. Nadine, where are you? Because I know you're here. Hi. <laughs> First of all, Nadine's amazing. And she is a prolific natural dyer, uh, soft sculpture creating, bed sheet dress making, biomaterial creating, pigment making artist she blows my mind so i last week couldn't believe how many pictures that we were tagged in and this one i was like wow this is really really beautiful what did nadine do now <laughs> well um so anyways nadine why don't you just tell us a little bit about this picture i know i think it's yeah talk about because you were with cord wainer's die and something like that i think it was yesterday but talk about this picture what did you do um, thank you, Amy. Uh, I'm just so excited to be here with you guys. Uh, so with this picture, I was experimenting with different sources of uh, colors that I thought would potentially be yellow. Um, and it's a mixture of both foraged and uh, dye extracts from botanical colors. So um, I was really, I was doing this process to um, really get to hone my relationship with uh, 
uh, how the materials react with each other. So uh, it's, I 100% agree with everything Keith was saying. This is so perfect because everything he was saying is what I think about with my work. I, I really believe that the more you um, can build a relationship with a color by through experimentation, the stronger of an artist or craftsperson you will be. So um, I was, I was playing around with different modifiers and different ways of applying the inks and just paying attention to, um, yeah, how they, how they turn out. <laughs> well, um, I just want to see if I can also get to, let's see. Oh, <laughs> hold on now. There's Nadine looking amazing, but yeah, there's, so Nadine also, I don't know what is happening with my computer today. I'm just like going to give up soon, but um, so Nadine has also been, she hangs out with us, uh, our after our after feedback Friday hangout every week. And we never know what she's going to be working on, but I think this is what you've been working on too. She's going to a, what a friend's wedding. And then you were trying to make a dress. Is this the same dress that you're trying to make? So nobody knew it was a bed sheet. Uh, no, so this is different. I made this because I was thinking a lot about yellow uh, for the Cord Wainers Die talk and it inspired me to create this piece. So this is completely separate from my my bridesmaid dress. I, I make a lot of clothing out of bed sheets and curtains. In fact, I'm wearing a curtain at the moment. Uh, but this one was specifically for this piece, which uh, talks about my thoughts with with yellow. I, I think yellow is very fascinating because it is it has such a duality. It represents both happiness and caution. And uh, I really want to make immersive pieces that invites the viewer to come and have like a bodily relationship to the work, so that they can contemplate their own experience experiences with with the piece, um, in, the, in this particular piece with the color yellow. I, I want people to uh, question how they feel themselves because our, um, you know, colors are a conversation, just, just, like, uh, just like what Keith was saying, uh, colors are a way to communicate. Uh, so I want people to become aware of what that, that's communicating to them. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks Nadine and so this is Nadino, at Nadino on Instagram. And you'll see all these crazy mad scientist experiments that Nadine is constantly doing. And it's just exciting to watch what you're doing. So thanks for tagging us. And thanks for doing all the, the cool things that you do outside of what happens here on Feedback Friday and all the great conversations. Nadine, where are you located? In Los Angeles, California. Oh, great. Good. West Coast. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. That was amazing. Thank you, Thank you guys. All right. Well, I think we're that, good, right? That was a really weird feedback Friday. So maybe, you know, it no, was it wasn't weird. This is how we started. Remember when I used to have coughing fits and coughing lose fit. my tr lose track? And, you know, I couldn't read my script. Yeah. We just had a little throwback day. It's okay. You know what? You guys all got to hear the song. So I didn't at least let you down there, but I'll have to do some troubleshooting on what happened with the Feedback Friday song. So apologies for. No, no worries. No worries. All right. You nervous at all. It's 10 10. I'm going to run away. Amy, right. I'm stopping the recording.